Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel, and hello! If this is your first time here and you like what you see, feel free to like, subscribe, and check out some of my other videos. Oh, and I have a challenge for you. If this video gets 100 views and 15 likes, I'll play and make a video on my most hated game ever. Let's jump in. So far this year I've been replaying and completing the Kingdom Hearts games and I thought it was time to play and revisit and take a deep dive in one of my favorite childhood games. Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance turned 10 this year and the series as a whole turned 20. 10 years ago Square Enix celebrated the 10th anniversary with the release of Dream Drop Distance on the 3DS and now 10 years later Square celebrates by announcing Kingdom Hearts 4. Let's go back to 2012. I was 11. So I was entering middle school. Those years of my life were tumultuous to say the least. My home life was awful, being neglected and abused by my parents, taking care of my little siblings while my parents abused drugs and alcohol in their room. There was not much light in my life. But I was very lucky to have grandparents that loved us all very much. They weren't wealthy and we didn't see them too often since our parents hated that we liked our grandparents more than them. But I was lucky enough to get a 3DS for my birthday from them. I played games like Kid Icarus Uprising, an amazing game, and Ocarina of Time 3D, and eventually Kingdom Hearts 3D Dream Drop Distance. I played Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 as a kid with my uncle, but I really had no idea what the plot was or anything like that. I just saw Kingdom Hearts on my own brand new Nintendo DS and was excited. I remember loading it up and immediately being pissed that Donald and Goofy weren't party members. Like what the heck, that's THE thing. It's supposed to have the half pints. That's what makes it Disney, come on man. I kept playing and fell in love with the game. I was old enough that I was getting pretty good at video games, and I played that game a lot. I did basically everything, and without guides since we didn't have internet, and even if we did, there was no way I'd be allowed on it. Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance was my little light in the darkness. I can't say that all my childhood memories were bad because games like this saved me. Sitting in the living room taking care of my kids' siblings and cuddling up while they watched me fight bosses, when I would let them pet the dream eaters are good memories that would have never existed without this game. We had it pretty bad at home, but games were my escape that I was so lucky and fortunate to have, and I wouldn't be the same person I am today without them. I don't even know if I would be strong enough to be here today without the light provided by them. And this game is one of the most memorable and brightest in my childhood. Alright, I think I'm ready. Let's take a deep dive into the world of Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance. We are back in the present, 2022. I replayed the game and captured all the footage on the 2.8 version of the game on the PS5. Does the game still hold up today, 10 years later? Is it ever any good to begin with? Will I ever stop talking and just start the video? Probably! The game opens up with a cutscene from before the events of Kingdom Hearts 1. Apprentice Xehanor has remembered who he truly is and puts his plan into action. Taking the hearts of his fellow apprentices and himself, creating the first members of the organization for Kingdom Hearts 2 and creating the Heartless is Ansem. Sora and Riku are back on the Destiny Islands and kids again, and they are fighting Ursula. I always thought this was a cool way to open the game as a kid, just beating the crap out of a mid-game boss from Kingdom Hearts 1 to open up the game, heck yeah. I always thought it showed how much stronger they are compared to when they were actually that age. Starting the game beating up some shadows, heck nah, we finna kill the sea witch bitch. I hope you like having Riku as a party member because this will never happen again. Ever. The raft breaks, oh geez. Right before they fucking drown, they manage to seal the keyhole for some reason. And wait, is that Ansem without his body like in Kingdom Hearts 1? Is this a hint of things to come? Like maybe all the villains we have previously defeated coming back to life with little explanation until right at the end of the game and everyone hates this game story because of that? Nah. Mr. Disney here explains that we won, we are super awesome, Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 are great games, but actually we didn't win at all, and brought back the super big bad from birth by sleep back to life by killing his heartless and nobody in Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 respectively. If Sora and Raikou were gonna beat this 8 year old man up, they had to take the Mark of Mastery exam, just like Taranaka did all those years ago. Except Mr. Sid here is a hardcore teacher and knows that Sora and Riku are much cooler than the virgin Taranaka, and give them a test to seal 7 sleeping keyholes. Even though Aqua became a master by playing with some balls in one cutscene. Since Sora and Riku are the only people that get things done in this series, they get the hardest test ever made, and with some emo remarks and peer pressure from Riku, they embark on the test. 
then count me in. Put me through the test. Just watch. Me and Riku will pass with flying colors. Back to game plan, we get the first dream dive of the game. These happen between each world. They look like gummy ships, except better in every way. You just get some prizes, maybe fight some enemies, maybe even a boss sometimes. Wowie! And get to the end. Only about a minute long, not too hard to do well on, aka A rank, and we are on to Traverse Town. Sora wakes up and is like, damn, I'm drippy as fuck. And wait, Riku, where, do you, where, where are you at, man? He wakes up another emo kid while yelling, and it's Neku from Game I've Always Wanted to Play but Never Have. I always thought the Woodlands of you was a great addition, showing love to another DS title. Great stuff. Sora immediately becomes best friends with Neku, and Neku does some sick parkour which Sora masters upon seeing once. This is flow motion. It's super cool, bouncing off walls, grinding on rails, spinning on poles. The freedom and great flow of each move into another gives this game my favorite movement out of the entire series. Moving to the second district, our first real battle starts and we see the enemy type for this game. Nightmares. The type of dream eater. We also see, because I didn't point out earlier, that this game uses the command deck instead of the command menu. While I think the command menu is the better system, the command deck in this game is really fun and gets really freaking cool later on. It's actually one of the best things about this game in my opinion. Anyways, it's the first real fight. It's not too bad, we move. Yeah, and Sid says, hey, remember Birth by Sleep? Well, we gotta find those dudes you played as in that game. I mean, that's not the part of this game, but trust me, we will do it eventually. Also, you'll encounter Dream Meters during your test. Bad guys are nightmares and good guys are spirits, okay? You can make your own spirits and these are your party members, okay? Sora moves on with his best buddy Neku and... <gasps> Neku betrayed us. Is that an organization member? But how? We murdered all of you indiscriminately in the last game. Sora is so shocked that he falls asleep. Don't! Neku! They're too dangerous! <sighs> what? Why am I so sleeping? Another dream dive starts and we are Riku. We land and we are still Riku. Hey, we get to play as Riku in this game. Which is probably the best thing about this game and my favorite thing. Riku being fully playable for the entire game is awesome. Not only does he have unique animations and commands, he has his own journey throughout the sleeping worlds that is taking place simultaneously. Dropping is the term used for switching between characters and is the main gimmick of the game. Riku drops right back to Sora right after some cutscenes and a couple battles. I think the drop system is much better than the system used in other games, aka one save file for each character. Breath by Sleep is a major turnoff for me because of the character system in that game. Dreamed Up does an amazing job of making the worlds different for both Sora and Riku, as well as not making them too long since you'll be in a similar setting for both characters throughout the entire game. Unless you play all as Sora and then all as Riku, which I definitely don't recommend doing unless you're a speedrunner I guess, then you do you. Back to the game, Sora delivers some mail for a while and eventually reaches some new districts of Traverse Town where he meets Rhyme. She really isn't important, she just has amnesia and disappears when it's boss time. Which is right now. Uncle Monkey. He's a big monkey who stomps and slams. First boss, you just kind of beat him up. Riku makes his way through a different part of town with a girl named Shiki. And they end up meeting a new guy. He has yellow eyes and silver hair, kind of like those other main villains. Rant later. Anyways, Riku fights the same boss, but this time it flies and is more annoying. After all that nonsense saying bye bye to their new friends, Sora and Riku seal the keyhole together from each version of the world and we move on. After beating a world as both characters, you get a cutscene that moves the plot of the real world forward. This time it's just a flashback of Yen Sid explaining the test. But at this point I'm almost on page four. Thanks for nothing, Yen Sid. We move on to the City of Bells. Sora does a pretty normal dream dive, nothing to see. Riku is the first dream dive boss of the run. Let me tell you, it's pretty wild. Queen Buzzer flies up, and it's a pretty simple fight. Dodge the bees, smack their asses, and then whack the fuck out of her face. The queen retreats, and the boys land. Both are met with Judge Frollo pretty early. Riku's a good boy and stops Esmeralda from getting captured. Sora's called little gypsy bitch by the man, which hurts his feelings so much that he kills all of Quasimodo's dream eaters. Wow. <laughs> I knew it was Dream Eaters! 
The main area of the world is the same for both characters. Sora has to kill some weeds and run through the sewers just for Esmeralda to tell him that the plot is happening back at the bell tower. Riku gets chased by the boss of the world on a bridge and through the town and everything's on fire. The boss chases Riku all the way to his new apartment when he is also told the plot is happening all the way back at the bell tower. The boys make their way back and now it's second boss time. The Sora version of the boss is pretty lame, one has a couple moves it spams. And it spams the shit out of them, and what, uh, you know, it's one of those bosses that has a move where it just flails around wildly after it's been hurt enough. But other than that, it's pretty easy. Sora beats the boss and says bye to Quasi, who has learned a lesson, I swear. And then, oh boy, is that, is that Vanitas? Looks like everyone is coming back. Hopefully Sora doesn't forget this happened by the time Kingdom Hearts 3 comes out. Now, in Riku's world, the shit is going down. He races up the bell tower. Judge Frollo fucking dies in front of him, which, I mean, also happens to Sora, but, like, Riku version of the world is more important, okay? Then, get this right. Ansem. The Seeker of Darkness. You know, the guy Sora mega killed in Kingdom Hearts 1? The new silver-haired bloke says Riku is scared of the dark, and I mean, come on, who isn't? That shit's pretty scary, to be honest. Then the Wargoyle shows up. It has big ass wings. Like, like they're really big. I lost where I am in the script. And Riku says his classic catchphrase before killing it. Personally, I prefer the air. <laughs> May I just say, the boss theme for Wargoyle is one of my favorite Kingdom Hearts tracks ever. It just might be my favorite from this game. So good. <laughs> After sealing the keyhole in both worlds, it's cutscene time. Our boys, Axel and Rox, are just talking about friendship like usual. When Axel wakes up in the lab from the opening cutscene, he's a person again, along with most of the other organization members that were killed in Cage 2. His boy Isa, aka Cyax, is missing though. But Axel's a somebody now. Welcome back to the world of existence, Lee. I guess Xehanort doesn't count. But where are Bray again? Isa. The grid is a really big world. It's the Tron Legacy version of the grid, which is cool. Not a lot really happens, especially for Riku. And the worlds are basically identical for Sora and Riku, they just start in slightly different places. Riku plays some light bike for way too long, and then does it again for a PlayStation Network trophy. After that, he just follows the main characters around for a while until it's boss time. It's a big bee dream eater that is ridiculously easy. It can only move in circles because it's a disc, you know? Like the movie? Remember Tron Legacy? Anyways, Sora's version of the world is a bit more interesting. Sora's BFF Tron from Kingdom Hearts 2 has become the Rinsler. His memory is wiped, his graphics are buffed, and he's mute now. Sora is sad. And I am also very sad. Tron was a super good character in Kingdom Hearts 2. He had real growth. The little message he leaves for everyone after you help him is adorable. And seeing Sora try so hard to get his friend back, even for just the little while that he's back on the grid, is sad and speaks volumes to Sora as a person. Rinsler and Sora are forced to fight. This is the boss of the grid. This boss is pretty easy since he's super weak to being blocked and then parried. The timing is super easy and basically all of his attacks can be parried. It takes a while, but it's pretty free. Sora, through the power of friendship and a good ass whooping, brings Tron back just for Tron to fucking die, protecting Sora from Clue, and then the world is done. Oh, Tron! Oh yeah, also, funny thing, I might need to mention this, um, our favorite boy, who we don't know the name of yet, is back. And he has a new friend. It's Zemnis. It's Zemnis. So, uh, I was joking earlier, this isn't the plot of the game, is it? Cutscene. Lee is pissed because he doesn't know where Isa is, and he's gonna figure it 
out. Next up, the boys make their way to Prankster's Paradise in Monstro. The world is much bigger for Sora than it is for Riku. At least it feels like it. I mean, my science isn't 100%, you know? Monstro is pretty quick, like in Kingdom Hearts 1, and this time Riku is just looking for Pinocchio instead of, you know, kidnapping. Who are you? Me? I'm me, he says. That's Riku kidnapping Pinocchio again? But he has an organization code on? Well then... Moving on, I really haven't been going over it much, but Riku has been going through a lot in this game so far. He's trying very hard to get past the darkness still and move on. He's often thanking Sora for being his light and friend and helping the others around him. Sora's helping people as well, but that's what Sora does. Seeing Riku be vulnerable around other people and try so hard to help them like Sora would is sweet and shows a lot of growth. Actually, I do. That stupid grin he's always wearing. He's the best teacher I could ever have. He isn't a completely different character, yet. Though he is growing naturally. He's still the rude Riku we all know and love. Also, for someone trying so hard to get past the darkness, Nomura really did him dirty, making all of his unique commands darkness-based. After running through the guts of Monstro and saving Pinocchio from his dark self, Riku fights the boss of the world, Char Clobster. There really isn't a lot to say about most of the bosses in this game, as they're all pretty much just big dream eaters. This one is very easy, just chase him around and smack him in the face. Sora meets Jiminy and has a really hard time understanding that Jiminy doesn't know him since this whole thing, you know, the sleeping worlds, yada yada. They go and look for the old not real boy, and oh no, turns out he's a super not real boy. Sora runs around the amusement park and the pleasure circus, and wait a minute, that's not Pinocchio, that's Zemnis. Zemnis? This is impossible! Okay, I will defend this scene a tiny bit for a second, but also not really because it's kind of dumb. Basically, if you look at the game records and treasure list, all that stuff has Prankster's Paradise before the grid. Almost no one will go to Prankster's Paradise first since the grid is a lower level world. They could have just made the grid the higher level world and this would have been fine, but instead everything in the game says Prankster's Paradise first, except the actual thing that makes you choose what world to go to. Anyways, Sora meets a blue who says Puppet is nice. Also, Monstro is going to eat them. Also, he's a donkey. Also, go around underwater for a while and fight Chill Clopter. Also, he sucks. Also, you're going to ride Monstro and then boom, the world is over. Thanks, blue lady. I appreciate you saying it instead of me. Spoiler alert, they seal the keyhole and watch a cutscene that, spoiler alert, only exists for Lee to meet up with the half pints later on. Traverse Town Revisited our boy Joshua needs some help, and Sora and Riku are happy to oblige. This madman, the Spellican, is creating other dream eaters, and the world ends with you gang is in trouble. Sora fights a bunch at the fountain, helping out Neku and Shiki, and they have a cute interact. Yeah, I'm Shiki. Nice to meet you. Neku told me all about you. Cool. But you should have seen him. He looked everywhere for you. Hey, Sora, stop talking. What? Why? You said you need her. That's a good thing. Uh... That's sweet, Neku. Riku meets up with Beat and Rhyme, and they have a friendly conversation. Thank you. I'm Rhyme. Riku, right? Sorry, my partner's acting like a doofus. I am not! You always gotta go around and, and garnish my reputation! Since when? You burned that bridge all by yourself. Nobody raises his reputation by lowering others. <laughs> Yo, Riku, you gonna sit there and let her get in my grill? Sorry, it's just... You two are cut from the same cloth. I ain't I made of cloth. Spelkin gets jealous because it doesn't have any friends, and Riku chases it to the third district where Sora fights it. And by that, I mean Sora has to rematch all the Dream Eater bosses so far. And then the spell again gets away. Iku and Sora make some friends. I hope return to Kingdom Hearts 4. <laughs> 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 wow. 
Once you find your friend, Sora, you should come hang out in our town. Definitely. See you in Shibuya. Sure. It's a deal. <sighs> Anything I should pass on to Riku? Nah. I'll see him soon. <laughs> They move on to the last set of worlds, after of course watching an awesome cutscene where they talk about Recoded, and more importantly Lee says, No, 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 I'm not, I'm not evil anymore. I'm a good guy now. Got it memorized? Sora and Riku make their way to the country of Mouseketeers. Riku fights the boss known as Baralamari. It's a pretty simple fight, you dodge its swings, break so it doesn't eat you and then smack its forehead balls. Second phase, dodge some more swings, hide behind cover from its super, and beat up its mouth balls. Dead. Riku's version of the world is a lot smaller than Sora's. Riku ends up at the big old building, the Opera House. And basically all of the world takes place exploring this one area. Riku is trying to stop the half pints from getting murdered by Pete by chasing around the Beagle Boys. After chasing them around for a while and saving Minnie who was kidnapped by Pete, Riku fights the boss of the world. Holy fucking moly. Holy moly is pretty annoying. They can make is that it teleports around everywhere from the floors to the walls, running away when it takes so much damage. After taking enough damage to get scared and just summon a bunch of hands like one of the earlier bosses in the game, the Riku version of Hacho Monkey, they smack you around, Riku smacks him back, and then it's smooth sailing to victory. Riku saves the day for Sora in his world and learns what it means to be a true musketeer. Oh boy. And one for all. In Sora's version of the world. He meets the Half Pints and King Mickey who are all incompetent losers at this point in their lives. Sora still doesn't understand how the sleeping worlds work and almost spoils the future for Mickey. Sora saves the day and decides to help the musketeer with their mission to keep Princess Minnie safe. While riding on the carriage gets attacked by a fucking T-Rex and Sora has to stop it. After saving the day, Sora looks and sees, oh no, I actually lost thanks to a cutscene. Dang it, my only weakness. The Beagle Boys have kidnapped the princess. Sora gives chase through a big ass canyon up a big boy tower and now Sora's pissed. He beats the shit out of the Beagle Boys and Goofy uses his ultimate technique to land the finishing blow. You've got an idea? And it might even be a good one too. Hold on. Sure. Take your time. Sure! The musketeers celebrate a job well done when oh no, Pete is a bad guy? I know I, I I physically cannot believe this. Pete is going to fucking drown Mickey in an underwater dungeon that we need to do right now. Sora goes there right now. It's a pretty big area, you're running on a beach and then through a big scary town and a bunch of Suri dungeon areas until you save the young king. The boys are heading to the opera house, you know, the one that Riku was exploring the entire game. Sora explores it a bit and then... <gasps> Riku comes in clutch, saving the half pints and Mickey from fucking dying to a big ass trap. Sora decides he's had enough and kills the Beagle Boys and Pete. Pete is a very easy boss. My favorite part of the boss fight that he says his classic line. Just like Cage 2, baby. Sora becomes a true musketeer with his homies, and now that the keyhole is sealed in both versions of the world, it's our favorite time. All for one, and one for all. Our boy Lee says something that we aren't allowed to hear yet, and apparently it's so shocking that Donald gets pissed and says, No way, Jose. We learn some valuable information here. First, that the mark of mastery test that the boys are on right now is not going as planned. Not at all, actually. Like, Tien Sid is a terrible teacher. He can't even locate Sora and Riku. Second, it seems that our boy Lee has joined the side of light and is roaring for battle. Fine. Let's jump right in. The last sleeping world. We're almost done with this game. But that's weird. I have. Eight pages left. Um, it's a world based off Fantasia, which I always thought was super cool. The plot is basically the same for both Sora and Riku. Princess Mickey has been super cursed, and Sora and Riku got to help by finding a music page from Shovel Knight. Riku goes through some forests and some snowy fields. Sora runs through some pretty fields and on top of the clouds. 
world is beautiful and unique, you love to see it. The only thing that I don't vibe with in this world is that when you hit an enemy with the Keyblade, it doesn't make the Keyblade sounds, and it's, it's, it's just weird. But it's also a cool attention to detail, so I can't hate on it, you know? Sora finds his missing Slender page, and guess what? It's our favorite boy. He's back, and he says... Beautiful world, isn't it? He also calls Sora a dumb, stupid, dumb, dumb head that doesn't even know that all of this was part of his master plan. I mean, Sora moves on and OMG, the sound idea wasn't enough. He has to kill Birdman from Traverse Town. This is for Neku, you sick fuck. So Birdo fucking dies and Sora seals the keyhole, which was in Yen Sid's hat. What the? What? After Riku finds his awesome page, he's shrouded in darkness, falling into the abyss. Our boy. Oh no. He finds a nice warm volcano to rest next to an OMG. Here we go again. Who would have guessed? Great gray boy says Riku is lame, and Riku says shut up and tell me your plan, idiot. Black Coatman says that Riku can control the darkness, which is OP, so they need Sora, not him. Or something? And then he spawns in Satan from Kingdom Hearts 1. It's basically another dream dive battle. You just dodge the attacks and hit him three times. Satan's least favorite number. And you win. Sora. Sora? <laughs> Funny. Just hearing that name kind of makes me want to smile. Yeah, that's how he is. What do you know? Riku and Sora. The sound ideas you two set free joined together. And when they did, they made a great and powerful harmony. Hm. Sora can find the brightest part of anything and pull off miracles like there's nothing to it. It's pretty hard not to smile around him. The heroes theorize that Xehanort used time travel to take control of the exam. Worrying for his friend, Mickey leaves to try to find them. Sora seems to have gone completely missing, but they can sense Riku is heading for a familiar world. Riku lands in the world that never was. He shouldn't be here. The test should be over. But since he's here, he needs to figure out why. Riku explores the empty barren halls of the organization's world. Climbing up huge buildings till at the end of it all, he finds Sora. They're in the same world, finally. It seems like Sora got here first. He's trapped in a nightmare, unable to wake up. A nightmare has come to stop Riku. The final battles have begun. This boss right here is, in my opinion, the hardest boss of Dream Drop Distance. Anti-Blackout Nightmare likes to teleport and spam you with projectiles and moves that come out of the ground where you are standing, comboing them together and sometimes delaying the attack so that you dodge a projectile just to land directly into a follow-up attack from the ground. It also has this super awesome move that drags you into the air and brings you to 1 HP, while also leaving behind HP balls that if picked up by the boss can fully heal it. So yeah, this boss is an asshole. And if you get unlucky for the dodge, you can get hit by that move that leaves you with 1 HP and you'll just instantly fall into another attack, which will kill you instantly. Pretty awesome stuff, right? To succeed in this boss fight, you just need to focus on everything on dodging and closing the gap between Riku and the boss. Projectile based magic is also highly recommended. After beating the nightmare, Riku keeps trying to wake up Sora until Ansem shows up and gives Riku the rundown. And you became exactly what that sigil on your back represents. A dream eater to protect Sora from nightmares. Me? I'm a dream eater? Correct. But you failed to protect him. Riku says, fuck the darkness, Ansem. I gotta save Sora. Ansem says, fuck you, Riku. Come on, we were friends back in the day, too. Ansem's pulling out all his tricks from Kingdom Hearts 1, except they're different colors now. What the... Riku uses the coolest move ever to drop the fight to the ground, and the music changes back to the Kingdom Hearts 1 and some battle music, but a bit cooler. It's just fantastic. After beating Ansem, Riku says, Come on, buddy, we can be friends. And Ansem says, Ever the fool boy, and forever a pawn of the darkness! I always have at least three phases, you dumb bitch. The Guardian becomes all big and protects Ansem in a cocoon, just like... Anyways, this boss fight is sick. You gotta use full motion to bounce off the walls and dodge his lasers, while he's forcing you back to stop you from hitting him. It's not enough to stop our boy, though. The Guardian puts his hand out toward Riku, like he knows who he is, and Riku recites the phrase he told Terra on the fateful day the Keyblade was given to him. Interesting. 
Riku leaves the dream and lands in the real world that never was, but is still in dream eater form because Sora is still asleep, and also there's no way they're letting you play as current time Riku that would not fit on the 3DS screen. Are you kidding me? Since we know what happened to Riku, let's see what Sora is dreaming about. Sora wakes up in the world that never was, chasing the king in the half pints. He sees an Amine and... Huh? Who are you? Why am I... Oh, hey, wait! Riku is calling out to him, but Sora can't hear too well. His ears are plugged. Sora just keeps on running through the streets. His vision is hazy. He sees... Oh, no. No, 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 I'm gonna... Just play the clip. Roxas! This could have been the other way around. Huh? But it really has to be you. What do you mean? There are so many hearts that are connected to yours. You're me, so you can feel what I felt. <sighs> no. Roxas, you're you. We're not the same. I wanted to tell you that. That you deserve as much as I do to be your own person. Sora, see? That's why it has to be you. Okay, I want to talk about this really quick. I know that everyone already has, but I love this scene. Okay, so, Roxas. This could have been the other way around, but it really has to be you. Roxas is not a bad person. His life was so short and he was forced into joining with Sora, so we can't help but wonder why him. Why it couldn't have been the other way around. But it doesn't matter. There isn't any hope in his words. He's accepted his fate. Sora telling him that he deserves to be his own person, that he isn't Sora, he's Roxas, just reaffirms Roxas' own words. See? That's why it has to be you. I don't think Roxas is a bad person, but he isn't Sora. He wouldn't have fought for Sora to come back if it was the other way around. Sora cares for everyone so much that he even tells his own nobody that it's okay to be yourself. And you can't blame him for not being as caring as Sora. After all, it's hard to accept death when life is so short. Riku is calling out to Sora, but at this point Sora has gone too far. He's too deep into the dream and too angry to listen even if he wanted to. Riku! Kairi! I found you! Huh? Who? Then. Then. Huh? Uh, 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 huh? As a kid, having no idea that Birth by Sleep even existed, this scene was so confusing, and now watching it, it is pretty sad. Sora is teleported away from his dream by Ansem, which well, happens right before the Ansem boss fight sleep. with Riku. Sigbar is here to make fun of Sora while also kind of telling him what's going on. Oh, thank you, Sora's heart. Sora says, wait a minute. I felt what Roxas felt, so that means he had a heart because you can't feel things without a heart. And Sigbar and Simna say, yeah, we can actually grow hearts. Xemnas also reveals that the organization was actually made to connect all of their hearts to Xehanorts, thus making them Xehanorts. Xehanort. Make more Xehanorts? You tricked your friends to... But you, aren't you scared of just turning into someone else? Me? I'm already half Xehanort. That's nuts! They still want to do this little 13 Xehanort's plan, but they want Sora to be the 13th. And Sora says... Once you side with us... I 
know the Keyblade didn't choose me. And I don't care. I'm proud to be a small part of something bigger. The people it did choose. <gasps> my friends, they are my power! As your flesh bears the sigil, so your name shall be known as that of a recusant. Sora's final battle has begun. Sora has to fight Xemnas alone this time. The best song in the whole game starts playing, it's a 1v1 to the death. Xemnas has a lot of moves from his first battle in Kingdom Hearts 2, and of course he starts throwing buildings at Sora, but Sora does the coolest move ever made and chases down Xemnas to finish the fight. After beating Xemnas, Sora is of course exhausted, I mean it took everything for both Sora and Riku to beat him the first time. Of course our boy, the legend, that has been following us the entire game, gives us the biggest exposition dump of the entire game. This dude is a young version of Xehanort, the main villain. He has the power to travel through time and is the one responsible for bringing all of the old villains back to life. He simply pulled them from their time and brought them to the present. He has been pulling the strings at the very start of the test. And the test was never a test anyway, it was just a way to send Sora to sleep. He even gave Sora his cool new outfit so that he could track him. With that, Xehanort does his legendary face grab and Sora has fallen to the organization's hands. Something inside Sora's heart though, seems like he's trying to protect him. Before I talk about the end of the game, I want to get something off my chest. I alluded to it way earlier in the video. But now it's epic sky guy rant time part one of i don't hate this game's story by any means but there are some issues i have with it first of all what the fuck is the point of a nobody i've heard everyone say nobody growing heart is stupid but like i haven't really heard anyone go in depth on this or maybe i just haven't been looking how is a nobody any different from a regular person at all if they can just grow their heart back what makes them special at all I love the original idea for nobody, the empty vessel that was left behind after a person becomes a heartless, the strongest of those being able to retain their consciousness and make decisions. Nobody was cold in their feeling because it was their nature, without a heart they couldn't help it. Their yearning to get their hearts back makes them strong, yearning being an emotion but they don't realize it, and that yearning leading them towards kingdom hearts. Then you have characters like Axel and Roxas who go against the grain and seem to have emotions, strong ones at that. Could have been a great message of going against the grain, how they broke through their natures and nobody became their own people. Even without having a heart, humans can still exist and thrive. They deserve life because even though they are different, they are still undoubtedly people. They aren't good or evil. Nobodies are blank pages. After all, they don't exist yet. Feelings can exist anywhere. Look at Lingering Well, an empty shell of pure hatred. That hatred and malice alone is what keeps it alive. Instead of that, which you may not think is a good idea at all, we got this. What was the point of organization's members that decided to rejoin the organization? We find out in March 3 they specifically say that they rejoin the nobodies. Why become a nobody again? What does it do? If you're recompleted, what's the point of killing yourself again, even if as a recompleted person you still want to be a bad guy? They don't even use the excuse that, oh, when you're a nobody you have darkness powers. Lee still does the whole darkness teleport thing in this very game, and he's a whole person. And the whole linking of hearts thing doesn't really come back in Kingdom Hearts 3 because they just get 13 versions of Xehanort, and the people that aren't linked to him in some way are just nobodies for no reason. The plot point of the linking the hearts makes no fucking sense. All you need is 13 darknesses and 7 light to forge the Keyblade. The light doesn't need 7 Soras, why the fuck does the darkness all need to be linked together to one dude? Saxx's character doesn't change when he joins the real organization 13. He isn't more like Xehanort, it's never mentioned that his grown heart is linked to them making him an evil dude. You even find out later that he's a double agent basically, and he became a nobody again for no fucking reason. He probably even grew his heart back during Kingdom Hearts 3. Speaking of that, what the fuck does being recompleted do? Like everyone that was recompleted is exactly the same characters that they were before, with just a different name and a new outfit. Speaking of which, Tetsuya Nomura is an amazing character designer, and he's made some of the greatest characters and outfits in gaming history. 
my god, with Kingdom Hearts, he really just did not give a fuck about creating good character designs. His art is still amazing, but almost every main character in the fucking series has the same jacket on the entire time. He designed their faces and said fuck it, the entire cast except Sora has on the same black jacket for 20 years straight. Also, let's make characters who aren't the same person in any way look exactly the same. That'll be cool and funny. At least the very end of Kingdom Hearts 3 gives a bunch of the characters, especially the main ones that switch sides, like Lee, Aiza, Shion, and Roxas, some new outfits. Everyone wearing the same thing forever was the opposite of creativity. At least we're done with the organization after Kingdom Hearts 3. Oh wait, Kingdom Hearts 4 trailer just dropped. <laughs> This is coming from a dude who likes Naruto, okay? You can do the whole look at this villain group, they have matching clothes things, and you can do it right. Okay, so here's why the Akatsuki is better. First off, there are way less members, and they don't fucking spawn in new characters wearing the jacket for no other reason than character design is hard. The Akatsuki is the antagonist for a while, but you don't often see more than two of them on screen at any given time. So you're not overloaded. Most of the Akatsuki members lose their jacket at some point, or its design changes in some way during their fights. The jacket comes off, it gets dirty, it gets ripped. The organization jackets are the exact same at all times and are always on. The Akatsuki jacket isn't just a jet black with a zipper, but it has some cool clouds on it, okay? That's pretty cool. Finally, the organization jackets started off as we are all a part of the same group thing, then it becomes a plot point. Ooh, look at this jacket, it wards off the darkness, now everyone in the darkness needs it to ward off the darkness darkness. The jackets the Akatsuki wear actually has meaning, while not being a super important plot point that makes it so that every character can't live without it. I don't want to spoil Naruto, but I'll give another meaning besides the spoilery one. Like Shinobi, who all wear this headband of their village, the jacket represents each member belonging to the organization, along with their rings. Anyways, I think that's all I have to rant about, probably, until we talk about Flick Rush and Secret Portals. Alright, here we go. How does this game end? Riku, with the help of Sora's Meow Wow, learns that Sora is being held in the most obvious place imaginable, the main castle from Kingdom Hearts 2. Riku uses the power of friendship to storm the castle and ends up in the meeting room, where, uh-oh, young Xehanort explains the plot of the series to Riku. Organization 13's true goal is to divide Xehanort's heart among 13 vessels. Thanks to you and Sora, we learned not all our candidates were fit for the task, but we managed to make up the difference. What is... The real Organization 13. <laughs> Young Xehanort is immune to time magic since he himself can move through time, I guess, and the fight is on. As a kid, this used to be my favorite boss fight, the setting is super cool, the music is great, his keyblade is kinda awesome, and his moveset is pretty cool. What do I think now? It might still be my favorite. Definitely my favorite boss fight is Riku. The fight has two phases. The first is just an all-out brawl against him where he's teleporting everywhere and spamming magic and keyblade attacks. The second phase is interesting. He stops time and protects himself in a clock barrier that you have to break while he's constantly barraging the clones that use the double blue lightsabers from a certain boss in Birth by Sleep. After beating him, Big Boy Xehanort appears and explains the plot of the series. Keyblade! Looks like Sora won't be the main character of Kingdom Hearts 3, it's about to be over. You. Axel! Axel? Please! The name's Lee! Got it memorized? You're not supposed to be here! Back at Yen Sid's tower, Sora ain't waking up. Riku gotta go back inside Sora's heart to save him with- Wait a minute. The power of waking? In your mark of mastery exam, you were to unlock seven sleeping keyholes. By doing so, you would awaken those worlds from their prison of slumber, and also acquire the power to free a heart from its sleep. The power waking was the whole goal of the exam, and spoiler alert, Riku's about to dive one last time and wake up Sora's heart. 
It seems like Yen Sid is implying he's using what will later be named the power of waking. So if Riku has the power of waking, which is the whole point of exam, why the fuck does Sora need it so goddamn badly in Kingdom Hearts 3? To the point where everyone makes fun of him that he doesn't have it. And it's the main, quote unquote, plot of the Disney worlds. Does Riku's power of waking only work on Sora? Did he not get it because of his sleeping worlds weren't technically real? But then why can he do it now? It's the point of Riku becoming a master, then if the main reason they took the test to become a master was to get the power of waking. All Riku gets from the master title in this game is a little confidence boost and some reassurance that he isn't evil, which we have known since Kingdom Hearts 1. Whatever, final boss time. Ventus, who resides in Sora's heart, is the one protecting him from the darkness here and now. He puts Sora's heart in his Keyblade armor. Unfortunately, Sora's heart and the heart's guardian are on the verge of being completely swallowed by the darkness. This boss needs a bit more health in my opinion. The boss fight didn't last very long at all. It hits decently hard and has a cool moveset with some gooey darkness based attacks. The fight ends with Shotlock vs Lynx in an epic DBZ style finish. Sora's heart is freed from the darkness, and Riku, still in Sora's heartlands, is in the Destiny Islands. Riku meets the hearts that are connected to Sora's, Roxas, Ventus, and Shion. They ask him some questions, and then Riku meets Ansem the Wise, who apparently before he died, lol, I'd imagine while he was working on the Sora Revival project, he made a data version of himself and his research and put it inside Sora's heart where he now exists. Basically, so if Sora, or in this case Riku, and later on Ienzo in Kingdom Hearts 3 found the data, they could figure out whose hearts were inside Sora. Too bad Riku doesn't remember any of this in Kingdom Hearts 3, and they kind of figure out Ven and Shion are in there by accident. Sora is awake. So, the game is over. Sora does a final dive through the credits and unlocks a secret message that I have no idea the relevance of. And he sees his old Dream Eater pals. Again, I always thought this was a nice touch. Now this is the part where I would give my final thoughts on the game and stop writing this stupid script, but I kinda just went over the story and the world, so now it's time to talk about the optional stuff, and you guessed it, getting the Platinum Trophy! <laughs> you may have noticed during some of the gameplay that I had different Keyblades on than what you're probably used to seeing. For a ranking all the dives on both characters, you get the Dive Wing Keyblade, which I used for the final world up until the final checkpoint on both characters before I beat the game. I wanted to get the End of Pain Keyblade, one of the few things I never got as a kid. I knew it existed, and I had an idea of how to get it, but man, I see why I never got it now. It is very unintuitive, time consuming, and also not fun. Basically in Dream Drop, it shows a forecast, and each time you drop in a world, there's a Dream Eater portal somewhere on that world. There's six of these on each world, besides the world that never was, where there are three. This is the same for both characters, doing all of them will get you the Keyblade. However, they aren't all available in the same drop, and they aren't even on a consistent rotation. You may, especially towards the end when you're missing just one for a world, have to drop over and over again just for the chance that the portal you're looking for will be on that world. The forecast screen will show you if the portal you have done is done or not. They're either having a silhouette or a big old done with the Dream Eater's picture revealed. Hang on, it gets worse. There will be a unique Dream Eater for each portal. Sometimes, they really hate you. And it's like the grid where four out of the six portals are the same Dream Eater, which means you'll have to check every possible portal location for that world to see if it just so happens to be the right one. After doing all of them in both characters, you get a crap ton of trophies and the end of Pain Keyblade, which is super cool. I love the design it has, the goat on it, which seems like a reference to Kingdom Hearts 3, since the goat has become synonymous with Xehanort, and it has the gazing eye, which only the Master of Masters Keyblade has, aka Xehanort's Keyblade. They aren't the same person by the way, I know that, don't comment. I don't think there are any actual lore reasons for this Keyblade's existence. It's just cool, and decently powerful. Next up is Dream Eater time. You may have noticed I didn't really talk about Dream Eaters that much in this video even though they're one of the main gimmicks. Well, now it's time. I tend to make every Dream Eater in the game, which wasn't too bad. I had all of them done by the end of the game except for the last two. The Skelter Wild and Lord Kairu, which along with the Green Dragon, take rare materials to make, which you can get from the world that never was special portals. Once I had every Dream Eater, it wasn't over. I had to make a specific combination to max out all my battle stats for an endgame trophy, and just to be really strong. That was Green Dragon Man, King Toad, and Seal Boy. Next up, you gotta get some high scores on all the Dream Eater minigames that I really don't care to talk about. They are pretty easy. 
The most time-consuming part of the Dream Eaters, however, was unlocking every ability and every command in the game. This meant fully or partially leveling almost every Dream Eater in the game to all the unique commands, as well as leveling a bunch of Dream Eaters to get all the permanent abilities like Combo Plus, Combo Master, and Treasure Magnet, things like that. How did I level up that many Dream Eaters in a timely fashion? Well, you see, there's this cool mini game that you can play called Water Barrel. It can be bought from any Moogle shop. You spend all your money on Water Barrels, start the mini game with the Dream Eaters you want to level, and then immediately quit the mini game, and you get some link points. And you just do that over and over and over again for a couple hours until you have every ability and command in the game. I did this part second to last, but I'll talk about it now since it has to do with Dream Eaters. Flick Rush. Did you ever play Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories and think, oh boy, I love this combat? Good, because they made an entire minigame where you just play Chain of Memories but with your Dream Eaters. Of course, you have to play extremely well and star rank every cup to unlock the final cup, which of course is the gatekeeper for a bunch of trophies in the game. The strat is pretty simple. For the final cup, use this team and beat the shit out of your enemies with the elephant since he's fucking OP. Have fun, here's a keyblade you'll never use. Boss rematches. The boss rematches are called secret portals, even though they aren't very secret at all. They just exist where you fought the boss of each world. I recorded footage for each rematch while I was playing. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go in depth on each boss again. Blah, 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 blah. You just fight the bosses again, but they have slightly more health and beating all of them with the unbound keyblade. The best one in the game, probably. Unless you like magic, in that case, there's one more thing to do. finding this dude by accident and bringing my 3DS to school to show my friends, and they all crowded around the table watching me fight this dude. Julius is a super boss for Kingdom Hearts Triple D, and it's pretty cool. You don't have access to your links, which lets you have some pretty hard hitting attacks and OP abilities like haste. He hits pretty hard and takes a decent amount of hits to stun. To my knowledge, he doesn't have any invincibility. If you're in the right spot, you can hit him at all times. To make up for this, he's constantly spamming hard hitting melee attacks. When he starts getting lower on health, he has a rage form of sorts that adds electricity to his attacks, as well as giving him a lightning storm attack that can be pretty difficult to dodge. If you get hit by this attack, Julius can lock your commands so you won't be able to use them for the rest of the fight. I recommend just dodging while he's enraged and not trying to fight until the rage form is ended. This is easy with Sora since hopefully by this point you have super glide. With Riku you have to do some flow motion though. After a tough battle, Julius goes back into his house for a nap. And your reward is the Ultima weapon. Next time, behave. So, that's it. You've grabbed every last treasure chest, which isn't too hard this time around, and made a purchase at every single Moogle shop, and done everything else I've talked about to you for an absurd amount of time, and you should have the Platinum Trophy. Unless you're me. I was missing one trophy and I didn't know why, having every ability maxed out and turned on. Turns out there's an ability only available in proud and critical mode, EXP Zero, so I had to play the game and level up a crap ton of Dream Eaters again. So I started another save, thankfully New Game Plus is good in this game and I got to carry over all my Dream Eaters, with some extras that I made to give me easy money early on, and I bought a crap ton of water barrels and re-leveled my Dream Eaters. A lot of the abilities you need are locked behind link gates. You need to use the Dream Eater in battle to link with upwards of 5 times to unlock a gate on a stream board letting you buy the ability. So I played through about half the game again linking with a bunch of different Dream Eaters. Oh yeah I forgot I had to link with almost all of them with Sora for some journal entries for a trophy. And after all of that, the last trophy is mine and Dream Drop Distance is done. My final thoughts. While I don't think it's a perfect game, it is still a damn good game and one of my favorites if not my actual favorite Kingdom Hearts game. While I think Kingdom Hearts 2 is probably an objectively better video game, there is something so charming about the worlds and the dream meters and the combat that makes this my favorite as well as being the most played Kingdom Hearts game for me from my childhood. The story is a little rough, and shit goes fucking crazy in the series because of this game and Birth by Sleep, 
but unlike Kingdom Hearts 3 where the story is fucked and the worlds suck for the most part, I really enjoyed the worlds and the gameplay for this game, and the story no matter how crazy it was, doesn't ruin the game for me by any means. Dream Drop Distance is an important game from my childhood that marked the 10th anniversary of the series and it was amazing to play it again 10 years later. This is a game like no other and a true gem among the franchise. Maybe play the other games first, but if you haven't played this one yet, it is worth your time. So, does Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance still hold up 10 years later? Damn straight. Thank you for watching. Hey, if you made it to the very end of the video, I just want to say thank you so much for watching it all the way through. This is my longest video yet, probably, and I'm so thankful for everyone that's been giving these videos a chance. My other videos are doing so well, and this has been so much fun. You are amazing. Have a blessed day in life, my friends. Love you.